Welcome back, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Roger O'Keefe, uh, or as I'm getting more and more used to in this country, um, O'Kefe. Um, and even better, because where I'm from, Australia, we have a middle name, um, <clears throat> whereas in Italy this is rather rare, I am always called Roger Michael O'Kefe, a bit like Giambattista, Gian Mario, or something like that. And uh, it's, it's not bad. I'd prefer to be called Giambattista, but um, <laughs> I believe in every language you should have your favorite name. So in French, I would love to be Thibault. Uh -huh, okay. Thibault. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Keep, 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 keep that in mind. Um, okay. Macron. <laughs> 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 Hello. Um, when international trade law um, kicked off in, well, it didn't kick off, but when it um, renewed itself in the 1990s, an idea came about, promoted by Americans, who I think probably tend instinctively to be a little mentally um, exceptionalist and perhaps isolationist, that international trade law did not exist within the international legal system. Indeed, they said the gap should not even be interpreted according to the rules of international law. Well, pretty soon people realised how absurd that was, that a treaty, an international legal instrument, should not form part of international law. And then every second book and every second article became international trade law and international trade law and human rights, international trade law and the environment and general international law. So too with international investment law. Well, if only to prove that we are immensely superior to such people, uh, this panel is on the convention, the Palermo Convention, and the international legal system. But of course, with UNTOC, it's always been known and conceived of that it sits within a body of other law. Obviously, general international law, obviously the international rules on states' criminal jurisdiction and its permissible extent, international human rights law, the rights of suspects and accused, the rights of victims as well. But, of course, with other treaty regimes too, it has a relationship. So we've heard the intimate relationship, if only informal, uh, between UNTOC and UNCAC. But then there are other areas. There are conventions on terrorism, uh, there is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, some of which, as Serena said at the beginning, one might not instantly associate with the Convention. Well, it's precisely those sorts of links that we will explore with our speakers. I won't detain you much further. I will simply invite our first speaker, Uglesha Ugi Zvekic, to speak on the Palermo Convention and the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Thank you, Uglesha. Okay, Giovanni Battista, thank you. Very <laughs> <much>. <laughs> this is in this ambient, I think this is right, right way to call you. Since. So uh, I, will, uh, I will address uh, the issue of um, UNTOC and UNCA, the relationship. It already was mentioned, uh, Cecile mentioned it, in, and, and um, they, are, they are related. Uh, and so just a few things that I wanted to say is that and obviously not, they are many, maybe they are trivial, but should, should be remembered. And that is that uh, there were, of course, changes in organized crime and corruption paradigms. And um, what I claim, but I'm not the only one, is that first of all, organized crime paradigm has changed a lot from using violence to using corruption. Mm -hmm. It is more and more using actually corruption. So traditional description of organized crime, even in UNTOC, yeah, you can interfere, you can make a reference to you know, violence, threats, extortion, and I would add corruption, which is an equal standing now with violence, threats, and extortion. So that's the first maybe trivial thing, but uh, th that is a reality. It's a reality. Second thing is that corruption paradigm has also changed from individual transaction to organized corruption. As a matter of fact, today, if you look at any serious corruption, and that I mean 
grant corruption, it cannot be but organized. And more often than not, actors in such organized cor uh, corruption are organized crime groups. Even if legal, legally lawful, lawful actors use corruption uh, to, get, to gain profit, they behave as organized crime group. And of course, as lawyers, we are looking at the behavior, not at who the actors are. And that's very important, I think, to have these trivial considerations and to keep them um, in mind. So <clears throat> I, I won't talk about that already, I said. So what, what uh, maybe uh, I would like to call it transnational organized corruption, and don't laugh at it. It's not only because we have convention against transnational organized crime, now we should have transnational organized corruption, but because we do have transnational organized corruption. And it is becoming more and more predominant paradigm on international level. And this is what I think international instruments should deal with it, and they do not. This is my second trivial point, third trivial uh, point. So uh, uh, I would also uh, uh, like to point out that actually uh, UNCAC was very much biased in terms that it is exclusively, almost exclusively dealing with public sector corruption, public administration, very little with private sector. It mentions it, but it's not really dealing with it, and it is not really dealing with grant corruption at all. No provisions to have any effective remedies against grant corruption, which I claim is very much today on international level, transnational organized corruption. So I think this is one of the loopholes of UNCAC. It has many others, but <laughs> this is at least uh, one. And why I am using the, here the expression of crime governance? Because at the international level, crime governance is how do we govern organized crime and corruption related to our, these two conventions? And can we govern them separately from each other? So this is my fourth a trivial consideration. And I claim that we cannot. Okay? We cannot deal with them separately. So uh, they all, all these co conventions, of course, are the normative uh, frameworks, right? Plus we have now uh, sustainable development goals, which is a political platform, which also talks about organized crime, corruption, illicit flows. So they are all supposed to go together, SDGs, UNCAC, UNTOC, and some others, of course, but I, we are now talking only about these two. So if we have these challenges in which the relationship between corruption and organized crime is much closer, then we also need to have a more integrated response. To an integrated challenge, we must have integrated response. We cannot deal with an integrated challenge with separate sectoral responses. So that's a consideration. And so actually we must have, I think in the whole UN system, much more, um, I don't know what is the word, cross-fertilization, integrate, whatever it means, Enhancement, I don't know what enhancement means, but everybody is using it, so. Synergies. Synergies, <laughs> synergies, yes. Of the various uh, UN anti-crime instruments. So it is not only UNCAC and UNTOC, it is also, you mentioned, or somebody, drug conventions. Remember that at the UN level, the first anti-money laundering mm. treaty was linked with the, uh, um, with the, with the drug, uh, drug Trafficking Convention, uh, preceding UNTOC and UNCAC, right? Uh, and with organized crime as well. It was a drug area with which we started looking at these things. Then, of course, we have arms. Uh, we have to look at that. It's not only protocol that my colleague will talk about, but it is also, for example, ATT. Uh, arms the Trade Treaty also has to be looked in the 
relationship to organized crime and corruption. Very important. We know that the biggest cases of corruption, grand corruption, are with armed deals. Uh, historically speaking, this is many examples of that. And of course, you know, terrorism that was mentioned, very important to, to, to also to relate to that, human rights and, and also environmental crime. There is a problem for environmental crime because, again, that apparatus is not well developed. And it needs to be much more developed. So we need this, this is so more integration in this response. Let me just focus now a little bit on Unka Kenuntok. It was already mentioned. What do they have in common? And I think, you know, first of all, they have in common morphological thing, and that is universality of ratification. Huh? One has 189 countries, UNTOK and UNCAC 186 countries. So three are missing, right, <laughs> to be at the, almost at the same level. So universality of ratification. They have both criminalization, and I'll talk about that. Both have prevention, right? but they structure. They are very similar, and they have international cooperation, and they have the same mechanism of governance and now of the review. So if you, if you look at the architecture of these two conventions, they are exactly the same. From an architectural point of view, I'm not an architect, but it looks like, uh, like that. So I mentioned these, uh, okay, there doesn't matter, 189 countries, all these protocols, um, um, Merida, uh, what are the offenses? If we look at the uh, UNTOC offenses, a part of the most fundamental and that is participation in organized crime mm. group, that was the novelty mm. on the international level, we have money laundering, corruption, and obstruction of justice. Huh? Out of mandatory and the only prescribed UNTOC offenses, these are the four. Okay? Then protocols have there a, a couple of other offenses that each protocol um, is envisaging. If you look at UNCAC corruption offenses, and you know that in UNCAC you have uh, mandatory offenses and you have optional. Yeah. And mandatory offenses, what do we have? Bribery, embezzlement, and then look, money laundering and obstruction of justice. Okay. By the way, all mandatory offenses in UNCAC are public sector offenses. Private sector related offenses belong to the optional ones. And we know by the evaluation that was done that very few countries actually have turned them into domestic law, those that regard private sector. So it is still very much marginal on the international level, but also in the national jurisdictions. So common offenses of UNTOC and UNCAC are, by definition, corruption, money laundering, and obstruction of justice. So on that normative level, there is a lot of, uh, if you like, principal uh, similarity. They both have prevention. Now, let me say that <coughs> prevention in UNTOC is very modest. Yeah. The article on the prevention of in UNTOC talks about reducing the opportunities and a little bit of awareness, and this, that's about it. On the other hand, the UNCAC prevention, corruption, is the whole chapter. Uh, there is a big difference. So much more emphasis on prevention we find in UNCAC than in UNTOC. Actually, as we know, UNTOC is much more law enforcement oriented convention than UNCAC. And I think that that also explains why prevention is much more developed, you know, more, more elaborated, if you like, in UNCAC than in UNCOC. In addition to having to establishing, for example, anti corruption agencies, this was an important, this is a building uh, anti-corruption infrastructure, right? That is what uh, UNCAC is doing, which UNTOC is not doing at all. Uh, it's promoting special investigative techniques, 
which are then again exactly the same in Untok and Dunkirk. And you know that some countries, including Italy, had up to recently problem of uh, accepting sting operations for in the corruption arena, right? There was a problem, now it passed, but it was a problem. And then we have international cooperation. I think uh, Cecily actually said they are e exactly the same, except for asset recovery, right? Which is a sort of new thing linked with Dunkak. But there is absolutely no reason that asset recovery should not be linked to organized crime profits. If this is the extradition of things, not of people, right? And there is no reason that asset recovery principles built in UNCAC should not be used in UNTOC-related offenses. So I'm just trying to point out that even this novelty at international level, international asset recovery, is applicable to both organized crime and corruption as they are treated in these two conventions. Government arrangements, governance arrangements. So what we have, the conference that uh, uh, was, we already talked about, so conference of the parties or conference of the state parties, but it's the same thing, they're just called differently. <laughs> one is COP, another one is COSP, but it's exactly the same thing. Very similar mandates of conferences, not exactly the same, but very similar mandates. And they are held, as you know, in alternate years, right? UNTOC or, or COP is always held in Vienna, and COSP is always held in some other country with some exceptions in Vienna. So the next mm. COSP is now in December in uh, Abu Dhabi, just before Christmas. But that's okay. In Abu Dhabi, December is okay. We can survive there. <laughs> it's a good temperature. Uh, so, uh, a lot was uh, said about the review mechanism. I will not mention, uh, not talk very much. But of course, there are disparities. Uh, UNCAC is already in the middle towards the end of the second cycle, and UNTOC has not started. It's in preparatory phase. Right? It was the claim. It's still in the preparatory phase. We still have to wait another two years that it starts yeah, with, the, with the review. So there is some. They, of course, I already said what I think about uh, uh, these two review mechanisms in comparison with UPR, that they are stepped backward uh, legally, uh, politically, and philosophically. They are definitely, for me, step uh, uh, so, uh, uh, we, what, what I think we need in the conference of state parties have never met together. Mm. Never, never. There is no relationship between these two bodies. Review mechanisms each stand on its own. The question was, is it possible to, uh, to do something about that? Yes, I think so. As you pointed out, number of materials that are provided for the review of corruption will automatically fall in the review of UNTOC. By nature, not by choice. It's a def default integration. But we have to absorb that default integration and utilize it. For that, we need mechanism. And if we keep these two review mechanisms and conferences so far away that they don't talk to each other, we cannot do it. That is running contrary to my plea for an integrated international response to new challenges, which is organized crime and organized transnational organized corruption. So if we keep them separate as they are now and as they are envisaged to work, we will not achieve this aim easily. Even if we integrate them, maybe it won't be easy, but there are differences of easiness, you know, degrees, <laughs> degrees, degrees um, of that. So um, I think that we must really uh, focus more attention to the prevention, international cooperation against organized crime and corruption, and also to integrate them, uh, others will talk about that, 
with human rights, anti-drug policy, terrorism, um, definitely, and of course, sustainable development goals. And I really believe that only in combination, but intelligent combination of these mechanisms and fora that exist, so conferences and instruments, review mechanisms, we can push forward this idea of uh, uh, having transnational organized crime and corruption challenges requesting integrated international crime governance response. So thank you very much. Well, thank uh, you, uh, Uglyasha, for a short, sharp intervention, which uh, really summed everything up very powerfully, clearly, and practically mindedly. Uh, next, we have Julie Alix, who is going to speak on UNTOC and the fight against terrorism. Oops. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thibault. <laughs> <laughs> So first of all, um, I, I would like to warmly, warmly thank Serena Folati for her invitation, uh, which sincerely honors me. Uh, <laughs> but I would also like to apologize to all of you for my poor English, which will uh, force me to speak very slowly and to read most of the time. I'm sorry for that. But I'm French, so. <laughs> uh, so. Palermo Convention and the fight against terrorism. The subject leads to the linking of two themes uh, that international law seeks to address separately. Indeed, the definition of organized crime, uh, organized criminal group in the Palermo Convention almost necessarily excludes terrorist groups. The organized cri criminal group must pursue a profit-making purpose while the terrorist organization aims to spread terror for an ideological purpose. International law thus reflects a, criminal, a criminological difference. The means of terrorism and organized crimes are sometimes the same because terrorists do not have the monopoly of, on terror, but the ends are different. Terrorism and organized crime therefore fall within two distinct uh, law enforcement systems under international law. Despite these two uh, these two distinct fields, the link between the links between the fight against terrorism and the Palermo Convention exist, and I wish to analyze them from two angles. First, from a, a methodological point of view, I'll try to show the divergence of approach of these two criminal phenomena in international law. Then, beyond this difference in method and beyond the exclusion of terrorism from the scope of uh, the Palermo Convention, these two international crimes inevitably present points of intersections. Those points require to question the ways of rethinking the articulation between the fight against terrorism and the fight against transnational orga organized crime in international law instruments. So in the first part, I'm going to examine the difference in the methodological approach of these international crimes. It seems to me, uh, to say it in a word, that the Palermo Convention represents a model, a horizon, for the international, international counter-terrorist system. Uh, first of all, because the Global Convention allows a unitary approach to a criminal phenomenon. Uh, after the failure of the 19, 1937 Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of Terrorism, the difficulties in agreeing on a common definition of terrorism led the UN to favor a sectoral approach. Thus, there is now <coughs> not one comprehensive convention against terrorism, but, but 16 conventions and additional protocols. Each of them intends to improve international cooperation in the fight against a type of terrorism, for instance, hostage taking, aircraft hijacking, terrorist bombing, nuclear terrorism, etc. A comprehensive convention to fight against terrorism has been draft, drafted sorry, since 2002, but it has not yet been adopted. The consequence 
of this sectoral approach is that some acts of terrorism rem remain outside the scope of the conventions. For example, a knife attack against civilians does not fall within the scope of any of the international counterterrorism conventions. The Palermo Convention demonstrates the feasibility and the relevance of a global cooperation instrument, in particular to combat a protein and reticular criminal phenomenon. However, terrorism and transnational organized crime have in common that they are not a crime but a criminal phenomenon combining different offenses. Hostage taking, destruction, murder, for example, for terrorism, drug trafficking, arms trafficking, tra trafficking in human beings, or corruption for transnational organized crime. The Palermo Convention demonstrates the ability of international law to capture a criminal phenomenal, phenomenon in a single instrument. Second methodological difference that I would, would like to point is that the Global Convention is a vector for a new procedural approach. The Palermo Convention is also a model for the fight against terrorism in terms of, it, of its content. Anti-terrorism conventions are classic, I would say rather minimalist conventions, mainly governing extradition and the juris jurisdiction of national courts. On the contrary, the Palermo Convention is a global convention in the sense that it consti constitutes a complete instrument of criminal policy. It combines a repressive and preven preventive dimension. In a very innovative way, cooperation in the aim of dismantling the criminal groups requires the development of genuine procedural cooperation. Joint investigations and the use of uh, special investigative techniques, such as electronic or other forms of surveillance and under undercover operations, are encouraged. The fight against terrorism is also an area which national laws are developing proactive criminal procedures, no longer to punish, but to prevent acts of terrorism, where special investigative techniques play a major role. However, international anti-terrorist conventions promote a very classical, classic judicial cooperation. Mutual legal assistance take its, take its part of a reactive dim dimension, I mean there, post delictum dimension. However, uh, sorry, there, there is therefore an increasing discrepancy between national and international law enforcement strategies in the fight against terrorism. International criminal policy to combat terrorism remains in the conventions, traditionally a reactive criminal policy, where states, states develop a policy of criminal prevention of terrorism. The Palermo, oops, the Palermo Convention is an illustration of how international law can follow national trends. However, while these trends are sometimes questionable, the discrepancy between international and domestic policy is problematic because it leads to evasion in the application of international criminal law. That is what is happening in the fight against terrorism and from which the fight against transnational organized crime seems to be better preserved. In general, the Palermo Convention is a model for counterterrorism system in the sense that it's based on the fundamental principle that the ultimate response to crime must be a criminal response. These inconsistencies in the approach and content of the conventions against terrorism and against the transnational organized crime are all the most curious because without fully overlapping, these two criminal phenomena undoubtedly present points of intersections so that the question of the legal approximation inevit inevitably arises. I will now examine for the second part the elements for rethinking the articulation between the international fight against terrorism and transnational organized crime. While terrorism and organized crime are two distinct criminal phenomena, there are points of intersection, as I, as I just said. 
The main of them is reflected, is reflected in the forms of support of terrorism, support for terrorism. Logistical support or financial support for terrorism often cr comes from the same waters as organized crimes, art, arms trafficking, drug trafficking, money laundering, cybercrime, corruption, for example, are points of intersection, are common. These points of convergence have been highlighted in the UN resolution since 1996 and in the 2006 Global Counterterrorism Strategy, the UN called on states to sign the UN Talk Convention. Support for terrorism, oops, sorry, it was there. I forgot one slide. <laughs> Support for terrorism is then likely to fall under two parallel repression systems the International Convention for Suppression of the Financing of Terrorism on the one hand, and the Palermo Convention and its protocol, especially on, the, on firearms, on the other hand. But since 2001, an essential evolu evolution in the fight against terrorism has taken place, which is, which is changing the equation. I'm talking about the emergence of an extrajudicial Repres uh, extrajudicial repression of terrorism. The international fight against terrorism changed with the attacks on 9-11 the, on and in particular with UN Resolution 1373, which led to the emergence of a general system of extrajudicial repression of terrorist financing. The asset freeze mechanism which is based, based on the UN blacklist, seems to have become the main operational tool in the fight against financial, financing terrorism. <coughs> in these circumstances, repression takes place in an extrajudicial framework and re relies on the cooperation of financial intelligence and banking services actors. Judicial cooperation is then largely marginalized. This observation of the marginalization of criminal tools goes beyond the fight against the financing of terrorism to cover the entire fight against terrorism. Chapter 7 of the, of the UN Charter now encourages the use of military and administrative tools to combat terrorism. Every time a military or administrative response is given to a terrorist crime, this contributes to the marginalization of international conventions on criminal cooperation. In this context, I wonder if a rapprochement between the fight against terrorism and the fight against organized crime shall be promoted. It's the question of the opportunity for legal rapprochement. In the current dynamic of preventive criminal policy, the value of rapprochement may seem obvious. Indeed, the prevention of terrorism requires the prevention of transnational organized crime and the fight against money laundering networks. Nevertheless, the globalization of the struggle carries with it the risk, the risk of contamination. Contamination of methods, contamination of administrative and military repression beyond the fight against terrorism in the fight against the entire macro crimes. However, for us criminalists, this is obviously a deviation that we must fight against. As the Palermo Convention proves, international law remains a bastion of the primacy of the, of the criminal law response to crime. The existence of an international criminal court to trial the most serious international crime, crimes is a symptomatic, symptomatic illustration of this. But international anti-terrorism law, like national laws, is in a state of flux. We can therefore see international law, as in domestic law, the emergence of what's been called an enemy repressive law. This enemization of the law is characterized by the marginalization of the criminal response to, to the detriment of parallel and weakly guaranteed repressive system, such as administrative freezing of assets, administrative prohibitions on entering or on leaving the country. The temptation to globalize the fight against terrorism 
and the fight against transnational organized crime may encourage the extension of derogatory and extrajudicial responses because the argument of operational efficiency is now predominant. The climate, the climate has changed, as you say. It is therefore to be hoped that the Palermo Convention will influence the fight against terrorism, but not the other way around. Therefore, we would like to see the adoption of a comprehensive convention against terrorism based on the Palermo Convention. On this common basis, it will then be necessary to develop criminal cooperation in the fight against all criminal organizations, whatever their purpose, ideological or profit-making purposes. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Julie, and in particular for highlighting um, this incredible paradigm shift. Um, if we only think that in 1993, the World Trade Center was partially bombed in the basement, and the response was wholly through criminal justice. And in 2001, we might have thought the same about a, a, a deliberate um, effort was made to shift the paradigm to a military one, uh, which has had effects not only for the law of international criminal cooperation, but more fundamentally for the law of the use of armed force, yes. and has uh, destabilized a central pillar of the world order and deformed uh, those rules, arguably. And the irony of all of this is that some of the greatest successes in the so-called war on terror uh, including um, the capture, for example, of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and people like that, um, has come about through traditional means of uh, arrest and uh, um, perhaps not extradition in the formal judicial sense of the word, but the equivalent. Um, so thank you very much for reminding us. Uh, now uh, uh, we have um, our chief host for this wonderful event, Serena Forlati, who is going to speak on UNTOC and international human rights law. Thank you, Serena. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your presence again. Uh, I have to keep up to what I have asked from others, and so I will be very brief. Uh, uh, but uh, the topic is, of course, quite vast. Uh, so I will just give a few highlights of what is my reflection on the relationship between uh, the UNTOC and international human rights law. Uh, stemming from some very basic, uh, more general uh, premises. Um, well, the first one relates to um, the more uh, general relationship between what we may call, uh, just for the sake of convenience, transnational criminal law and international human rights law. Transnational criminal law meaning in this context uh, those instruments relating to the fight against crime that simply impose a, uh, on states or on parties in general obligations to criminalize at domestic level specific behaviors while not in pre providing for criminalization directly by international law. Uh, could we see these two bodies of law uh, as being, of course, different, separate, but also complementary one with the other? Um, a second uh, general premise in this context is that I, um, I see myself at least as a generalist international lawyer and my overall approach to the relationship between different bodies of international law is that uh, international law is a legal system which should be coherent uh, on the whole and that there are methods uh, to ensure coordination between different branches of international law. Uh, so the general idea is that international criminal law in the broader sense uh, should actually uh, be drafted or the rules should be elaborated and implemented in such a way as to respect human rights uh, and there should be mutual compatibility, something that has already been raised, and that there are tools of interpretation of rules, specifically systematic, systemic integration, systemic interpretation that can allow for such compatibility, although uh, striking the right balance in practice can be very, very difficult at times. Um, 
Now to the issue, to the point of complementarity between the two systems. Uh, this complementarity has often been argued and is something that is quite well established. If we think of the um, of international criminal law in the narrow sense, so of those crimes that are directly criminalized by international law and for which we have international institutions uh, that uh, ensure uh, that uh, there is no impunity, at least should ensure that there is no impunity for the commission of those crimes. But can the same be said also of transnational criminal law? This is much more controversial, of course, and uh, specifically as regards corruption, for instance, there is a lot of discussion as to whether the fight against corruption is also a fight for internationally protected human rights. I would not like to, to enter into this discussion right now, although maybe some uh, comments could be made afterwards. Uh, but um, I also um, think, this is at least my, uh, my tentative conclusion, I would like to hear your comments on this, that there are definitely some transnational criminal law instruments that are also functional to promoting, protecting human rights, and that the link between criminal law and human rights protection is very prominent, at least. Just to make one example, the United Nations Convention Against Torture mm. has a lot of provisions concerning the exercise of criminal jurisdiction, uh, criminal prosecution, uh, criminalization as such, and it is basically seen as a human rights instrument. Uh, it is not the only one, we could think of others, uh, some are also instruments, such as the Convention Against Torture, that cover situations which could amount to court crimes in some mm -hmm. circumstances. In some others, the factual background is not such as to engage, for instance, the jurisdiction of the ICC. And mm, while I would not like to discuss this in general, my uh, tentative uh, conclusion is that for the UNTOC, especially for the protocols, but also for the Convention as such, this link to uh, human rights law is uh, quite prominent and present. It's not uh, that in every situation this link might be there, but it is uh, one of those instruments that could also be seen as being functional to protecting, protecting human rights. Um, why do I reach this uh, conclusion? Well, the Palermo Convention is a very broad instrument. We said this earlier. Uh, it has uh, the p a capacity to apply to a very broad range of crimes. Uh, there is one provision that has not been mentioned so far, which is, in my view, at least the key to this broad application, Article 3, when it provides for uh, uh, the fact that the Convention covers serious crime as defined at domestic level, mm -hmm. grants a very very flexible uh, possibility to in, uh, broaden the scope of the convention. Um, at the same time, uh, the convention is definitely not a catch-all instrument. It's not that we find there everything of international law. And I think uh, the uh, judgment of the ICJ of uh, last June uh, in the case between um, Equatorial Guinea and France is there to remind us of this. The problem there, one of the problems addressed by the International Court of Justice was the interpretation of Article 4 of the Convention, which is a, a savings clause uh, that um, uh, sort of imposes uh, to, to carry out the obligations uh, stemming from the UNTOC. Uh, while also respecting the principles of sovereign equality, territorial integrity, non-intervention in the domestic affairs of states. So a broad range of principles. And actually, uh, Equatorial Guinea was uh, relying on this clause to argue that uh, the second vice president of uh, Equatorial Guinea, who was accused, is uh, uh, actually was also uh, condemned, I think, sentenced mm -hmm. by now, uh, by French domestic authorities for crimes related to the UNTOC, uh, would have to enjoy immunity uh, as a uh, high-ranking state official, not only as a matter of diplomat uh, sorry, of international immunity law, but also under the UNTOC framework, which would in turn grant the ICJ jurisdiction over the case under, under that specific heading. And the International Court of Justice took a very restrictive approach to this point, stating that Article 4 does not incorporate uh, the customary international rules relating to immunities in the uh, Convention framework. Uh, the statement was 
uh, slightly broader, uh, that is, uh, also these other principles that are referred to in Article 4, not only sovereign equality over which uh, the regime of immunities is based, but also territorial integrity and non-intervention, are uh, to be understood as simply as general principles of international law and not as incorporating the more precise rules that are developed in, in customer international law on the basis of such principles. Um, but uh, this said, um, international human rights law has a special place in the convention framework. Uh, and it is on this special place that I shall spend some words. Um, uh, it is actually a, a dual place that is emphasized also by the fact that the convention is a modern uh, international criminal law instrument mm -hmm. or uh, penal law instrument. Uh, the uh, integrated approach that some um, people already mentioned and the fact that there is this strong emphasis of prevention uh, does make this element of the relevance of international human rights law uh, more significant in this than in other contexts. So uh, f I would like to uh, first briefly look at how human rights are treated in the text of the convention and then look at uh, whatever considerations we may make on this issue. So we do have some quite scant references to uh, human rights as such in the convention, uh, especially the uh, two uh, um, saving clauses of the optional protocols on trafficking and non smuggling, which expressly uh, um, uh, state that the convention is without prejudice to international human rights law as such. Um, we also have some less uh, explicit references in provisions that uh, refer to the need to enforce sanctions with res while respecting the rights of defense, for instance, or in the case of extradition, uh, that the person subject to extradition should enjoy a fair treatment. And this includes, of course, domestic uh, fundamental rights guarantees, but also international uh, uh, obligations uh, which bind the states, which of course can be very varied in content depending on the level of uh, acceptance by that particular state of uh, international uh, human rights uh, instruments. Of course, customary <coughs> law and especially peremptory norms bind the states at, in all, at all times, but uh, for, for treaty law, the situation is different. And uh, another element that has, uh, again, already been mentioned uh, relates to the flexibility of the convention. Some, several provisions of the convention leave states a wide margin of flexibility in deciding if and how to implement a specific provision in a given situation. And this also provides leeway uh, for states to be fully compliant with their human rights obligations while implementing the convention. This is also, of course, a perspective where we look at the position of those suspect of crimes, those subject to prosecution. Um, and in this perspective, I think there is little um, doubt that the convention can and should be implemented while at the same time respecting international and human rights law. Uh, even if the text of the convention is not so uh, explicit in many aspects, I think the whole a uh, way in which the system has been applied and developed so far uh, points to this direction. Even looking at the outcomes of the single working groups or the conference of the parties, there is the idea that uh, the, the compatibility between these two areas of law is something that is uh, considered and taken care of. Um, but can we also see the convention as a tool for protecting human rights? I think this is a more tricky mm. aspect. Um, and um, we don't find so much explicit, again, in the text of the Convention. However, we do have some hints in the uh, preambles or as, uh, documents that may look or have the function of a preamble uh, of the Convention and of the different protocols. Uh, General Assembly Resolution uh, uh, 5525 that uh, adopted the, uh, the Convention uh, does not point out specifically to this link, although it does refer to the social implications of organized crime as justifying the adoption of the text. And if we look at the preamble of the firearms protocol, again, there is a very loose reference to the social and economic development uh, and the right to live in peace that are endangered by the trafficking in firearms. Um, 
Again, uh, we have some uh, indications which are a bit more explicit in the other two protocols, the smuggling protocols. Uh, preamble refers to the fact that the smuggling of migrants can endanger the lives and security of the migrants involved. And perhaps more explicitly again, uh, the trafficking protocol uh, refers to the absence of a universal instrument in the fact of on trafficking as being detrimental for persons vulnerable to trafficking, which will not be sufficiently protected. So here the link between the adoption of the instrument and the need to protect the human rights of trafficked persons is more explicit. And then uh, still, we don't go very far in the direction uh, that I would like to, to explore. Um, but again, in the Convention itself, we find some provisions that uh, would seem to fulfill this function, explicitly, uh, especially provisions safeguarding human rights of the victims, but also of those that are involved in criminal investigations at different levels, uh, notably witnesses and those who cooperate with authorities, uh, the idea uh, that their security should be protected is clearly aimed also at protecting their uh, fundamental rights, although this is not said in these very words. This underlies the uh, function of the provisions. And then we have, of course, specific provisions on the assistance to victims, especially in the trafficking. Uh, protocol, but also, I mean, Article 16 of the smuggling protocol, I know it's controversial and the protocol does not define smuggled, smuggled migrants as victims of crime, but still, there are some provisions uh, safeguarding their own uh, safety and dignity in the uh, uh, enforcement action against smuggling. And then also provisions relating to aggravating circumstances, again, in the smuggling protocol that go in the direction of uh, specifically targeting particularly uh, forms of uh, smuggling that put in danger the life, for instance, of smuggled migrants. And then again, there is the emphasis on the prevention of crime. So the idea that crime uh, that puts in danger fundamental rights uh, of individuals uh, should be uh, not only be object of criminalization, but also be, object, be the object of ob obligations in the area of uh, exercise of criminal jurisdiction uh, is present and is also uh, very clearly stated in the convention, but there is also a broader uh, emphasis towards the prevention of crime uh, that is not simply through criminal law preventive measures, so seizures, pre-trial uh, measures, but more broadly on the prevention of crime. And what has been said earlier about Article 31 is true. The, uh, Article 31 is not uh, that precise in terms of the kind of obligations it establishes, but this emphasis of prevent on prevention is also in the protocols. Uh, and I think there is a lot of room to develop the meaning of those provisions, uh, especially uh, Article 31 refers to best practices, and there is a, has been a lot being done also in the area of international human rights law, which could provide input as to how pro to pop properly implement mm. this aspect of the, of the convention. Uh, and as a last point, uh, what I would like to uh, finally look at um, is the way in which the UNTOC is seen from the outside, that is, in the perspective of international human <coughs> rights law. Because I think this is what is more striking uh, in emphasizing the complementarity between the two regimes. So it's not just the UNTOC that sort of seeks to uh, adapt to uh, needs and uh, requirements stemming from international human rights law, but international human rights law and especially monitoring bodies have been using the UNTOC as a tool to foster protection of human rights. And this can be seen in, for instance, statements or stances by UN treaty bodies which call upon ratification of the UNTOC and qualify it as an international human rights instrument. This is not only for the UNTOC, it happens for other treaties, but I think it's quite interesting to look at this. And uh, also, uh, this is something I've been looking into quite uh, in depth, the um, uh, the UNTOC has been used a lot by the European Court of Human Rights in its case law, for instance, on trafficking, but not only on trafficking in persons, uh, as a tool uh, for the systemic interpretation of the Convention and um, for assessing the exact content of uh, positive ob uh, obligations uh, arising upon states under the Convention. Um, 
it, of course, uh, is used as other criminal law instruments to justify limitations in the enjoyment of fundamental rights protected by the Convention, but also in this other more proactive uh, way. Um, and, for instance, the obligations of uh, relating to the exercise of jurisdiction that arise under Article 15 have often been uh, uh, relied upon by the court in order to assess that states uh, were bound or were not bound to exercise criminal jurisdiction as regards trafficking in persons uh, because uh, this would stem from the UNTOC and the indications found in the UNTOC. Um, uh, I think that this kind of approach with, through which um, the UNTOC is used as a tool uh, whereby uh, due diligence obligations, this is actually the nature of uh, international obliga positive obligations in the field of human rights, uh, are filled in with content, is not something that uh, attaches only to the European Court of Human Rights. Other human rights uh, courts use the same kind of approach. Uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, mm -hmm. somehow goes in the same direction, although the case law is not as well developed. And I think it's really a more general uh, function that the UNTO can serve, uh, uh, through which integration, uh, again, uh, the focus on integration, can be uh, fostered more broadly. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Sedana, for a very rich, uh, insightful, and uh, in some ways imaginative um, approach uh, to a very interesting question. And at one point you touched on something which took us back to this morning in the institutional questions. Um, because, as you say, the Convention on Torture, and you could say the same about the Convention on Enforced Disappearance, which mm -hmm both grew out of human rights concerns, but are not themselves human rights instruments, the international criminal instruments, but they have the enforcement mechanisms of the international human rights system, and whether that can tell us something about uh, the enforcement um, ideally, or, or perhaps not. Perhaps there's been, as we say, a retreat from that in relation to other conventions within the field of international criminal law more squarely. Uh, our final speaker before the discussants have a go is Irini Papanikolopoulou. She will be speaking on what at first may seem a surprising topic, um, but uh, I'm sure there's lots to be said about it too, and that is UNTOC and the International Law of the Sea. Thank you very much, Roger. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank uh, Serena Forlati and all the organizers of this conference for their very kind invitation. It has been very interesting so far, and uh, I think that uh, coming at the end of a very long morning, I should try to keep my presentation very short. So I don't have a PowerPoint, I actually had one, but decided not to use it. And I'm not going to go into details, but be please feel free to ask me any clarification questions. And I will just go directly to some points I would like to make. Now, first of all, why a presentation on UNTOC and the law of the sea? Uh, I thought it was for the pleasure of having me here mm -hmm. and <laughs> giving me the opportunity of being again in Ferrara, which is a place that I very much like. Uh, but maybe there is something else. Uh, mm, and uh, I think that the obvious reason is that uh, there is uh, transnational organized crime that takes place at sea. Mm. Well, the heydays of piracy are probably gone, or maybe not, uh, but we all remember all the discussions uh, about piracy. And then we have all sorts of uh, criminal activities. In some cases, the sea is the place where the criminal activity takes place. Uh, let's think of fisheries crimes, uh, which are quite significant. In other cases, um, or the smuggling of migrants uh, by sea, although usually it's part of a more complex uh, travel for the migrants, uh, in other cases, the sea is just a means of uh, one of the many means used uh, to uh, engage in transnational crime. Let's think about uh, trafficking of drugs, uh, 
while many drugs are transported by sea. Why do we have so many criminal activities at sea? There are many reasons. Um, I have identified the three practical reasons and one which is a legal reason. First of all, the seas are huge. It's tried to say that they cover 70% of the earth. So even for statistical purposes, if you have something that covers two thirds of the world, then probably you do have crimes there as well. In the second case, um, the seas are vast and they are very difficult to patrol. They need not only individuals, but they need vessels, and vessels are expensive. And they need other monitoring techniques um, that uh, have to cover much vaster expanses than at sea. Uh, sorry, that on land. And then, of course, we have to take into account the dangers of being at sea. Um, the maritime environment is an inherently dangerous environment. So any activity that takes place at sea is more dangerous. Yes, it is more dangerous for the criminal groups, but it is also more dangerous uh, and needs uh, special precautions uh, on behalf of those who undertake any enforcement activity. In connection with this, we also have a legal issue. And this is the very complex pattern of jurisdiction that exists at sea. I, when I teach law of the sea, I usually start by saying that the sea is different from land. This is obvious. But it is different not only because it is water, but also because it has a different legal framework. Land is divided between sovereign states. There may be disputes on boundaries. Uh, there may be territories which are disputed. Uh, but essentially, we always have one state that has sovereignty over a specific portion of land. And this is, by default, the state that has to ensure protection against criminal activities. Uh, so the issue is, as was very much discussed this morning, uh, how do we oblige states uh, to comply with their obligations? Uh, so we know that states have obligations with respect to their territories. Uh, how do we oblige them to carry them on? The situation at sea is much different. Uh, apart from a very narrow belt of 12 nautical miles maximum, the sea is not subject to the sovereignty of any state. Uh, there is no state that has sovereignty over the vast majority of that 70% of the planet's surface. So there is no default state. We have to see which state is responsible for ensuring protection against the criminal activities at sea. And what we have is this complex pattern of allocation of jurisdiction. So this makes it more difficult not only to oblige states to comply with obligations they have accepted, but also to prove to a state that actually does have the obligation in that specific maritime space with respect to that specific, that specific criminal activity. Now, um, of course, uh, this is an issue that is going to grow, the attention on blue economy and the riches of the sea, but also the relevance uh, of the sea as a means for transporting people and goods. Uh, 90, more than 90% uh, of maritime trade uh, happens, uh, sorry, of uh, world trade happens at sea. So uh, I think that as we have seen the last years, uh, criminal activities at sea are going to increase. And this is where we need some regulation. So we have spoken about UNTOC, I'm not going to address that one. I'm going to speak about the law of the sea beat and then seeing how they can interact. What is the law of the sea? I thought I was going to skip this, but I realized that maybe not everyone is familiar. It is a field of international law, so it's part of that huge field that, that international law is, so it partakes of the basic characteristics of the law of the sea, but it also has some peculiarities. Mm, the law of the sea essentially is the law that regulates uh, activities that take place at sea, as opposed, uh, if you want, to the law of the land. And uh, it has one main treaty, which is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. It's quite widely ratified, but not as much as 
Puntoc. It has at the moment 168 parties, which include 167 states plus the European Union. It has many other treaties. For example, we have treaties concerning fisheries, um, the United Nations Fish Stocks Agreement, um, the FAO Treaty on Poor State Control with respect to fisheries, uh, many regional treaties. We have uh, treaties relating to um, navigation and maritime activities, uh, which also include uh, um, aspects relating to security. So, for example, we have the Ships and Port Facility Security Code, um, the ISPS, uh, which is a part of the SOLAS, which is the fundamental treaty relating to safety of life at sea, but it is about security. So, um, we have a fundamental treaty, the Law of the Sea Convention, the Constitution for the Oceans. Uh, we have many other treaties. Um, they are not ratified by everybody. So an additional complexity is that uh, one has to see on a case-by-case -case basis whether a specific state has ratified the relevant treaties. What does the law of the sea offer in the fight against uh, transnational organized crime? Uh, well, it allocates uh, jurisdiction. The main purpose of the Law of the Sea is to establish which state can regulate a specific activity in a specific sea area. And it does so essentially on the basis of two criteria. The first one is uh, um, a sort of geographical, let's call it territorial criteria. So the sea is divided into maritime zones. Uh, we have the territorial sea, then the contiguous zone, the exclusive economic zone, the continental shelf, high seas, international seabed area. I'm not going into details, but please feel free to ask me if anything is needed. And for each of these areas, we always have at least two states that have jurisdiction, except the last areas. So it is the coastal state and the flag state of the vessel. So the second criterion, as opposed to the geographical criterion, is a sort of nationality criterion. That is, the flag state, the state of a flag of a certain vessel has always some sort of jurisdiction over vessels and their activities at sea. So you see, flag state jurisdiction, coastal state jurisdiction, they interrelate in different forms. Um, essentially, the closer you are to the coast, the more rights uh, the coastal state has. The further off you go into sea, then these rights diminish until you reach the high seas where the principle is that there is the exclusive jurisdiction of the flag state. But what does this mean? It means that um, there is an exclusive enforcement jurisdiction. Only the flag state can stop, uh, search uh, the ship, uh, conduct investigation, arrest the people and the ship, uh, and so on and so forth. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, no other state has legislative jurisdiction, that is jurisdiction to regulate conduct happening on the high seas, or even adjudicative jurisdiction, that is jurisdiction to adjudicate on breaches of rules, either national of the state, national of another state, or international taking place on the high seas. So this is what the law of the sea offers. It also offers, but I have to admit it's not much, some specific rules about some specific criminal activities. Uh, so uh, probably you all have heard about uh, the rules on uh, piracy, which are included in the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, we have some rules um, against uh, illegal fishing in fishing treaties. Uh, we have some rules against uh, conduct uh, which endangers uh, maritime navigation in the SUA Convention. Uh, uh, but this is a very piecemeal approach, uh, by no means comprehensive. So we have jurisdictional framework and some specific roles. Uh, it's not enough, clearly. And then we have UNTOC, uh, 
Can the two integrate? Uh, well, yes, of course. Uh, first of all, for systemic reasons, uh, they are both parts of the system of international law, and we know that uh, no legal regime in international law is an island. Uh, they are all parts of the continent. But uh, also because there are specific provisions uh, to this effect. Um, so the Law of the Sea Convention contains a general provision, which is Article 311, eh? according to which um, the Convention does not alter other agreements uh, compatible with this Convention. Eh? First, it allows for agreements that derogate from the Convention eh? as long as they don't go against the basic principles of the Convention, and also expressly safeguards uh, international agreements uh, expressly permitted or preserved by other articles of the Convention. And one very important uh, provision uh, in this respect um, is Article 110, uh, which is uh, um, an exception to the exclusive jurisdiction of the flag state on the high seas. Uh, now, uh, this is the right of visit. Uh, so, in some very strictly regulated cases, uh, a state different than the flag state can visit uh, a vessel on the high seas. But uh, the article starts saying that um, a state can exercise some form of jurisdiction on a foreign flagged vessel in this situation but also where acts of interference derive from powers conferred by treaty. So this is one of those situations in which uh, a Law of the Sea Convention provision expressly safeguards uh, a different treaty, not one specific treaty, but any treaty that allows for the exercise of powers against vessels on the high seas. And therefore it falls not under the provision of 311 that, uh, yes, other treaties uh, are allowed to exist uh, as long as they are not incompatible with the Convention, but under the, mm, which is the second paragraph, but under the fifth paragraph, uh, which is uh, in any case, whatever they say, even if they go against the Convention, other treaties expressly safeguarded by specific provisions uh, will prevail on the Convention itself. Uh, why I'm saying this, I will come to it in a moment. Uh, the same we have, uh, for example, in the smuggling protocol. Um, so Article 7 of the smuggling protocol has a general safeguard clause according to which um, activities to prevent and repress uh, smuggling of migrants at sea have to take place in conformity with the law of the sea. It doesn't refer to the Law of the Sea Convention for a very simple fact. There are some parties to UNTOC which are not parties to the Law of the Sea Convention, just to mention a couple, the United States, um, Israel, Venezuela. So there is this general safeguard clause. I would therefore say that from a technical perspective, there is not much to say about the compatibility and the possibility of integration of the two legal regimes. So what about the synergies? They can be integrated. How can they be integrated? Of course, uh, using powers attributed by the law of the sea, to enforce uh, duties under the Convention on Transnational Organized Crimes. So states have to criminalize conduct, which state, well, the flag state, the coastal state, and so on and so forth. The second place, uh, UNTOC provides for criminalization of conduct uh, which is not uh, really addressed in the law of the sea. So it fills uh, gaps uh, in the law of the sea regime. Uh, there was a third possibility, um, which is that uh, the Law of the Sea Convention provides for a binding dispute settlement mechanism uh, on the basis of which um, states uh, can be brought in front of an international judge if they don't comply with the Law of the Sea Convention provisions. The problem is that this is very state-centric. So you have to find one state which will sue another state, uh, for example, for not acting in the case of piracy or drug trafficking or anything else. So I don't have much faith in the use of this system. 
And this introduces us to the problems, which also are challenges that need to be addressed at the moment. Uh, the first and foremost from a law of the sea perspective is that uh, the law of the sea convention and the law of the sea generally is still very much premised uh, on the prominence of flag state jurisdiction. And uh, I can assure you that uh, among law of the sea scholars and practitioners, this is the big issue. First of all, because of uh, what are called the flags of convenience, uh, you may have heard about them. So states essentially granting their flag without any link uh, with vessels. You Google a certain address, you find a web page, you enter some information, you put in a credit card, and uh, one week later you receive the flag in a parcel at the address you have indicated. And that's all the contact between the flag state and the vessel or the owner or operator of the vessel. And then, of course, how can you base any control on that kind of flag state? Um, but also we have another issue. And this is uh, the very great ease uh, of reflagging. We tend to, to think of vessels as having one flag. Well, there are some cases in which states have two flags and this is illegal generally. But what actually happens is that the same vessel can change flag again and again and again and again, even within the same year. So they will change flag according to uh, what uh, treaties uh, states ratify, whether they are uh, taking a joint action with other states, uh, on a number <coughs> of reasons. So this is a very easy way of avoiding control. Because as we said, it is the actual flag state that has exclusive enforcement jurisdiction when the vessel is on the high seas. Now, uh, other regimes uh, provide a unique uh, possibility of addressing this issue. As I've said, uh, there is exclusive flag state jurisdiction on the high seas, Article 110, unless uh, there is a different provision in a specific treaty. So uh, it is uh, possible for states to provide in specific treaties that other than the flag state states have the right to board and inspect vessels. But uh, this was a missed opportunity in UNTOC. Uh, no such provision was included. Uh, essentially, uh, Article 8 uh, of the smuggling protocol, which is the only one that deals with activities at sea, repeats uh, the law of the sea convention paradigm. So if there is a vessel that has the same flag as a state that wants to intervene, then the state can intervene. If the vessel has a foreign flag, then the state has to ask the permission and be granted permission by the flag state before undertaking any action. And uh, it is not only the case that the flag states uh, will reply in the negative, uh, I'm not sure they actually do reply in the negative often, but they very often don't reply at all. And if the flag state doesn't reply, it means that it doesn't give authorization and then it means that you cannot intervene against the vessel. So, missed opportunity. Uh, the second issue is that the allocation of jurisdiction, flag state, coastal state, in some cases other states, uh, is not comprehensive. Uh, just to make a very clear example, uh, there is no rule saying which state exercises jurisdiction on uh, platforms uh, on the high seas. We have rules on platforms uh, in the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. Um, uh, in the case of the territorial sea, this is part of the territory of the state, uh, so it's under the sovereignty of the state. No one has uh, any rule, no treaty has any rule on the high seas. Uh, and these gaps and ambiguities are exploited by criminal groups. Uh, third point, uh, law of the sea allocates power. If you read the relevant provisions, they say the state can, the state has the right, the state may. This is not the same as state saying the state must do something. The state must control criminal activities in its maritime zones. The state must control use by criminal groups of its vessels for criminal purposes. 
uh, we have an article 94 which says that the flag state has to effectively exercise its jurisdiction, but in administrative, technical, and social matters. No mention of criminal matters. So this is something that needs to be addressed. And finally, very briefly, tying with uh, the last presentation, uh, the issue of human rights. <coughs> it's very much relevant at sea as on land. And there is nothing in the law of the sea. Well, there is very little, there is very little in UNTOC. So we don't have a bilateral relationship, UNTOC law of the sea, but we have a triangular relationship, UNTOC law of the sea human rights. And this is something we have to address. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Um, for, for those of you who, who don't know that in English, the pirate flag, the skull and crossbones, is known as the Jolly Roger. So I've always had something of a soft spot for those crazy guys at sea. Yeah. Um, I now pass on to Rosanna Garciandia, uh, who is one of our two discussants. She will be talking on the link between corruption, corruption, correct? Yes. Yep. And human trafficking. Yeah. Thanks, Roger. I will first of all, let me join my colleagues in thanking Serena and the center and her whole team for this wonderful conference uh, and the panel for what's been really an insightful um, overview of so many areas that connect with UNTOC and UNCAC. Um, our first speaker today was touching upon the connection between the two conventions in a very uh, inspiring intervention. And I believe that this afternoon there will be also uh, panelists covering the protocols. Um, taking that into account and having heard also, I was very pleased to hear uh, a mention to the SDGs, to the Sustainable Development Goals. I would like to share with you some brief remarks on the protocol against trafficking and in particular uh, on the link between corruption and human trafficking. As you obviously know, the Palermo Protocol focuses on trafficking in persons and considers forced labor, sexual exploitation, slavery or servitude as forms of exploitation that the trafficking may intend to infringe. Now let me share with you uh, data that may, be, or, or may shed some light on, on, on the implementation of, of this aim. By 2018, 93% of the state's parties to the Palermo Protocol against trafficking had implemented legislation criminalizing sex and labor trafficking. Uh, in principle, this sounds as a very positive and hopeful figure, but indeed enforcement of anti-trafficking legislation at the domestic level remains uh, very challenging indeed. And one of the main reasons for this is corruption. Uh, it is by now widely accepted that corruption is one of the drivers facilitating trafficking, as we've repeatedly heard today. Uh, but more than that, it is also hampering investigations and prosecution of offenders. Uh, corrupt officials may turn a blind eye to trafficking networks or alert them to imminent investigations, allowing them to change their tactics, tactics and compromising investigations and prosecutions. Um, obviously, that link between corruption and trafficking is being uh, more and more explored as uh, tackling corruption would uh, reduce the risk of trafficking and improve the effectiveness of those investigations. It's actually been the focus uh, of various initiatives of the UNODC Secretariat, and maybe Tanya could tell us a bit more about that later. Uh, just to mention an example, uh, there have been some interesting workshops uh, in the Asian region in involving civil society, involving government experts and uh, sub-regional representatives of Cambodia, Myanmar, Thailand, or Laos. In 2018, uh, as UNODC had identified that in that specific regional area, uh, the link between corruption and some migration-related crimes, crimes uh, came across quite strongly. 
Now, beyond these capacity building exercises and initiatives, the intersection between corruption and trafficking also raises interesting questions on the actual connection between the two frameworks, the, the two conventions, the relevant protocols, as we've heard uh, today in this panel session. I will use, if I may, my condition of discussion to raise a couple of longer questions to panelists. Um, keeping in mind this idea that international law is a framework that should be coherent, including the law of the sea, uh, human rights law, and, uh, and other areas. So the first uh, question concerns the interaction of the two frameworks. Uh, and I would like to, to emphasize, although the link between corruption and trafficking is generally accepted, uh, it seems, and my impression from the discussions today is that that idea has been emphasized, that although this connection is acknowledged, uh, the two frameworks seem to continue working to some extent sort of in silos, if I may put it that way. Uh, Transparency International or the International Bar Association, just to, to mention two institutions, have suggested that joint forces, uh, joint task forces uh, should be encouraged, in, uh, integrated by anti-corruption and anti-trafficking experts uh, along the same lines of the ideas that we heard today of uh, cross-fertilization or uh, looking for more integrated systems. And uh, my question would be obviously, as Serena was mentioning, UNTOG is not meant to be uh, an all-serving purpose sort of instrument, but given that it, there seems to be uh, a feeling that more integration is needed, based on uh, the experience of all those of you who have been uh, working closely with some of those organizations, and uh, obviously there is a very interesting mixture today in the room. Uh, what would be your suggestions in terms of how to operationalize uh, that uh, enhanced synergy or that enhanced cooperation that seems to be needed? Um, and then my second question is more, uh, more specifically on, on one provision of the Palermo Protocol against trafficking, particularly on Article 10. Article 10 covers, as you know, obligations of law enforcement and immigration authorities and other, and other public authorities. But it is limited to training and exchange of information, which is necessary, which is very important. But now my question would be, do you think that that article per se and the uh, existing synergies between the two conventions are fit for purpose to tackle corruption of public officials in connection uh, to human trafficking specifically? Or would it be desirable to explore uh, other alternatives such as, for example, uh, the mention in the Council of Europe Convention, it's Article 24C, of uh, corruption of public officials as an aggravating circumstance in the, in the crime of trafficking. I know it's a, a specific question, but also interestingly, Serena mentioned aggravating circumstances in the uh, protocol against smuggling, which does not incorporate uh, specifically um, corruption as an aggravating, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, the person involved in is a public official as an aggravating circumstance. So uh, those would be my two main questions to panelists, and uh, we'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Thank you, Rosanna. Uh, I've written them down, so I think what we'll do is have Alessandra Annoni first, who will then, um, I guess, pose her questions as well, and then we'll, we'll, we'll open it up a little bit. We'll, we're, we're going to go uh, until 1.30 for those of you who are hungry. Um, Alessandra. <laughs> Okay, so I feel I'm the only obstacle before <laughs> food. <laughs> wow. Don't worry, it's not the drinks at the end. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, Serena, for allowing me to, to speak in this panel. And actually, my role would not so much be the one of posing new questions, but trying to add an additional layer to the discussion by discussing the relationship between uh, Antok and core crimes, or uh, criminal U.S. gentium, if, if we prefer. Um, the idea is to see whether 
ANTOC may play any role in the international cooperation to enhance the international cooperation for the repression of these kind of crimes. What I will be talking about is certainly not vertical cooperation, the cooperation with international tribunals, but rather horizontal cooperation, the cooperation between states for the repression of core crimes. Um, as recalled in the preamble of the ICC statute, uh, it is indeed, first of all, the duty of states to try and repress these kind of crimes, and to exercise jurisdiction over those crimes. And the preamble of the ICC statute also clarifies that the effective prosecution of the most serious crimes of concern of the international community should take place, first of all, by taking measures at national level and by enhancing international cooperation between states. Now, the need to enhance international cooperation between states in this field is particularly felt nowadays, for instance, in former Yugoslavia, uh, with the closure of the ICTY, uh, regional states have now the uh, opportunity and the duty to try and prosecute those that are responsible for the crimes that have been perpetrated in that area. And they are all uh, experiencing severe difficulties in ensuring international cooperation by the other states of the region because of the lack of a, uh, um, a fit legal framework. Uh, arrangements for international horizontal cooperation for the um, repression of core crimes is also particularly needed, I would say is also paramount, if a state is willing to exercise universal jurisdiction, because in that case evidence is abroad, the accused person is usually abroad, so all tools of mutual uh, legal assistance need to be um, used. Now, International humanitarian law lays down several uh, provisions, several obligations to cooperate for the purpose of repressing core crimes. We have the out de de out judicare um, provisions in the Geneva Conventions. We have Article 88 uh, of the first additional protocol that deals specifically with mutual assistance uh, for criminal proceedings conducted abroad and the execution of foreign criminal sentences. According to the International Committee of the Red Cross, there is a general obligation, a customary law obligation for states to cooperate for the repression of core crimes. What IHL does not do is to lay down the tools to ensure this kind of um, cooperation. Um, if we look at crimes against humanity, the situation is even worse because in that area we don't even have an international convention, uh, a comprehensive convention on crimes against humanity. Um, the International Law Commission is, uh, in, has started working on the topic and the, the draft articles on crimes against humanity that have been adopted on, in first reading by the International Law Commission deal extensively with horizontal cooperation and um, strangely enough, uh, I would say, uh, most of these provisions are built on UNTOC. They, are act they actually mirror uh, provisions in uh, in UNTOC. Uh, the need for tools for horizontal cooperation in this field is felt uh, indeed by states. A few states started an initiative to conclude an international convention in, uh, in this field, not only concerning crimes against humanity, but concerning also genocide and, and war crimes. Uh, a draft convention on international cooperation in the investigation and prosecution of the crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes was indeed concluded in late 2018, uh, but it, of course it's still not into force. So my question would be, what is the role of UNTOC in this field? Is there any role, uh, rather than just being uh, a model for a new convention, is there any role UNTOC could play now uh, to enhance international horizontal cooperation in, in this field? 
Now, this leads me to address uh, one of the main assumptions that we usually have, that core crimes are something that are ontologically different from transnational uh, crimes. Uh, the former are politically motivated or ideologically motivated, so they are not organized crime in the sense of the um, Antok Convention. My feeling is that there is at least some rule some room for overlap, so some situations where UNTUK could actually apply to um, core crimes and should be applied to enhance international cooperation in this field. The case of trafficking in human beings is destructive. Uh, trafficking is, of course, uh, a transnational crime. It's the object of a protocol of the Palermo Convention, but it's also mentioned under Article 7 of the ICC statute, uh, and it's it could be uh, a, um, crimes against humanity insofar as it is perpetrated as part of a widespread and systematic attack against a civilian population. And the elements of crime clarify that uh, this attack against the civilian population may be the in furtherance of a state's policy, but also in, in furtherance of an organizational policy. So that could also be a criminal organization. And this is probably why the prosecutor of the ICC has stated that she's closely looking at the possibility of opening an investigation about trafficking in human beings in Libya. Now, there would be then the issue of whether the mandate that the Security Council has given to the ICC in that field also covers this. But this is a completely different uh, issue. Um, War crimes, uh, I think that is there also some room for overlap. Not all, not all war crimes are ideologically motivated. Not all war crimes are uh, state-sponsored. Uh, we may think, for instance, of pillaging. Mm -hmm. This is for material benefit. Or even uh, sexual exploitation or rape. These are um, crimes that are perpetrated for a material benefit in the sense of UNTOC, sexual gratification is considered as a material benefit. So I think there is some room for overlap, and I think we should try and use these situations where the two legal regimes overlap to try and use UNTOC as uh, even more as a tool to enhance international cooperation, even in this field. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Alessandra. Well, I, I guess in the brief time remaining, um, although Alessandra said she didn't really uh, ask a question, I guess there's an implicit question um, in what she said, which is to everyone on the panel, well, do you agree? Do you think there is this room? And to remind us that Rosanna asked um, in relation to opera operationalising enhanced synergy with respect to cooperation between UNCAC and the Human Trafficking Protocol, how might we do that? And Rosanna's other question was in relation to Article 10 of the Human Trafficking Protocol, um, whether that is enough uh, to deal with the phenomenon of corruption of public officials uh, as an aspect of human trafficking, or would we go for something like we see in the Convention of, uh, Council of Europe Convention and use the fact that the person was a public official as an aggravating circumstance. Now, I don't know if anyone on the panel wants to speak to one, two, or all of those things. Um, Serena? Just a, a brief comment on Rosanna's, which also draws to a uh, reflection I was uh, making before on what Ogi Trekish, Ambassador Trekish mentioned. Um, on aggravating circumstances, I will be, say, uh, stick to that. In fact, there is nothing in the ONTAC preventing states from setting up mm -hmm. further aggravating circumstance. Yeah. States may do a lot of things that are not mm -hmm. uh, imposed yeah. by the UNDOC, but yeah. are uh, either encouraged or simply in their own discretion. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the challenges here, also thinking of what uh, was said by others, uh, is that states tend to do just the minimum. This yeah. was said also uh, as regards the criminalization of uh, optional criminalization provisions of the ANCAC. Mm -hmm. 
but we see it also as well as regards the optional provisions on the exercise of jurisdiction under Article 15 of the UNTOC. So here it seems that notwithstanding encouragement, states tend to do the minimum level uh, of, uh, and this is I think one of the uh, problematic aspects if we want to go further in setting up an efficient system, these optional provisions uh, should be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just a brief comment to Alessandra. I like very much the idea. And I think there is uh, quite a lot of room. So, for example, I was thinking about the uh, reduction to slavery. Uh, thinking again about the maritime environment. Uh, unfortunately, slave labor on board fishing vessels uh, is a very widespread practice. Uh, and it is by definition transnational. I went to see again the definition of transnational and I realized I should have said this before, doesn't mention the sea, doesn't mention areas beyond state sovereignty. But uh, clearly, even if it is a Korean flagged vessel with uh, uh, Vietnamese or Filipinos uh, or Thai fishers on board which have been trafficked to work on this vessel, it is enough to have a transnational organized crime, even if the people were trafficked by their own people, but it's a different flag, or maybe it's fishing in a different area, New Zealand waters. This is a real case. So uh, I think there is a lot of room there. I just wonder, and I would ask the people with more experience, uh, is there anyone interested in bringing forward these uh, situations? because there is so much uh, that happens out there. I'm thinking of the sea because this is what I know, but I imagine the same is on land. And uh, then we, we even have the rules uh, sometimes. We just uh, don't uh, think, think about them. That is not even we scholars suggest solutions that might be picked up by civil society and then bring states to do something. I might say something on what Alessandra suggested, um, because uh, many states right now are wondering, well, how can we punish uh, our nationals who went as foreign fighters yeah. to Syria and Iraq? And if someone asks me this sort of thing, well, I say, you've got plenty of tools already at your disposal. Um, <laughs> you know, you've got the first protocol, this and the other. They say, ah, yeah, but the problem is our government defines what went on in Syria as a non-international armed conflict. We don't have a convention in that regard. And then I say, well, Antok, you know, they enslaved women and sold them as chattels. Yeah. You know, they um, pillaged and illicitly trafficked cultural property. Yeah. And you have nationality jurisdiction, you have universal jurisdiction, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, the obligation to prosecute or extradite. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just that simply no one has thought, I hate this expression, like, you know, um, thinking in silos and whatever, but you know, outside the box, and thought, well, hang on, just because it's a war crime doesn't mean it has to be prosecuted as a war crime. You know, uh, I have this all the time in the cultural property area. It doesn't have to have cultural property written on it, you know, to prosecute it. And I think the same in this regard. So I would wholeheartedly agree with you. Yeah, sure. Say that again. You don't actually, this is the irony, you don't actually need a transnational element even in, 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 in there's only one convention in fact where there is a genuinely transnational element. Um, but it's, if they're members of Islamic State uh, and you've... Mm -hmm. No, I'm not necessarily talking about extradition and things. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah, just talking about domestic. Exactly. Yeah, sorry, I was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I think the transnational element is there many times in, when it comes to war crimes. I mean, the foreign fighters' mm -hmm. idea is that you can think that part of the preparation of the crime was done in another yeah, country, and that's the transnational element. As for the participation of, yeah, and the trafficking, and the participation of an organized criminal group, it really depends on how you understand an, uh, an organized criminal group, what material benefit means. I mean, if it's three people uh, joining forces to organize a ring of trafficking women, 
it's an organized criminal group to my, to my mind, even if this is done in the framework of, in the context of an armed conflict. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. It seems that at the end we came back to the question of naming um, and that, you know, sometimes we, have, we can give multiple names to the same phenomenon, which and potentially opens up multiple legal regimes um, for the repression of that phenomenon. Well, I thank all of our speakers. I thank all of uh, both of our discussants, and I thank you and your stomachs for their patience. <laughs> Um, my father, who was a barrister, then a judge, and then the second um, commissioner of the Independent Commission Against Corruption in New South Wales, Australia, a state famous for its corruption, and that's saying something given that the competition is Queensland and Western Australia. Um, uh, how did I get onto that? Um, my father. What was the... Uh, oh, yes. When he was a... When he was a barrister, when he was a barrister, um, he pleaded with the court and said, now, um, Your Honour, I could go one minute into the lunch adjournment and then we would be finished argument for the day. We wouldn't have to come back. And the judge banged the thing and said, no, the court is hungry. <laughs> so, so thank you to all uh, and to the court and we'll see you at 2.30. <laughs>